Hey guys, Professor Gooden here to talk to you about how we examine the relationships between two different variables using correlations. I'm Dr. Jacob Gooden, Professor of Kinesiology at Point Loma Nazarene University. And in this video, we'll examine correlations and how to interpret them. This information comes from the textbook Statistics and Kinesiology, which is linked down in the description below. And it was written by Drs. Vincent and Ware. Now, a correlation is used to quantify the degree of relationship or association between variables. So, for example, if you wanted to know how a vertical jump relates to performance in the power clean, you could use a, co a correlation to tell you that relationship. So, do people who jump higher also tend to be better at power cleaning, especially once they know that movement? Well, most of the research would say yes, people who are able to generate explosive lower body power in order to jump high can do the same thing in order to move a loaded bar as fast as possible into the power clean position. So we know that there are some underlying physiological mechanisms that support both the vertical jump and the power clean. And so therefore these variables are related. We would say that there's a relationship or an association between them. And in this case, there's a positive relationship. Now we use a correlation namely usually a Pearson R correlation to look at the linear relationship between two sets of variables. Another example could be the vertical jump and 100 meter sprint times. So typically the higher you can jump, the faster you can sprint. But because sprint times go down the faster that you are, we would call that a negative correlation or a negative relationship because the higher you jump, the lower your sprint time is. And so if we plotted that on a graph, you would see a downward sloping line. Now we're going to get into all of the details about how all that works with correlations. Now one of the most commonly used measurements of correlation is the Pearson product moment correlation coefficient, which is a mouthful, so we just abbreviate it by saying Pearson R. And this coefficient is named after statistician Carl Pearson, and the R value will always range from negative one to positive one. The closer that R is to an absolute value of one, so either negative one or positive one, the stronger the relationship between the two variables. Now, the converse is true as well. If R is close to zero, so the farthest away from one or negative one, then there is no relationship between the variables, at least in the sample that you're measuring from. Now, a technical definition of correlation is the extent to which the direction and size of deviations from the mean in one variable are related to the direction and size of deviations from the mean in another variable. So for a positive correlation then to occur, subjects who, subjects who score above the mean on x, so on variable one, also score above the mean on y. So in this case, our example of a vertical jump and a power clean would be a positive correlation because it tends to be that the higher you can jump, the more weight you can also lift in a power clean and vice versa. Now a negative correlation is when subjects who score below the mean on X score above the mean on Y. So in this case, a vertical jump and a 40 yard dash time. So you can jump higher and that means you probably can sprint faster, which leads to a lower time for that sprint in this case a 40 yard dash. So in reality, what a correlation is doing is it's taking the product of the z-scores of x and y values that are paired together and adding up all of those products. And if the sum of all z-scores is above zero, then it's a positive correlation. And if they're below zero, then it's a negative correlation. And if some are above and some are below and they basically cancel each other out, then it is no correlation. And so we want to look at both the magnitude and the direction of R. So the magnitude of R, again, is how far from zero R is in either case, so either one or negative one. So the closer it is to negative one, the larger the negative relationship is. The closer R is to positive one, the larger that positive relationship is. And then we also want to look at the direction or the sine of R. So if R is negative, 
then of course it's a negative or inverse relationship. And if it's positive, then it will be a positive relationship. So here is an example of a scatter plot showing a positive correlation. And we could probably guess that those people who are good at triple jump here on the y-axis tend to also be good at the long jump. And why is that? Well, because we use all of the same biomotor abilities for the triple and the long jump. We need explosive musculature, we need good stretch shortening cycles, we need a fast approach up to the takeoff zone, we need a relatively good strength to body weight or power to body weight ratio, and all of those things would factor into both a good triple jump and a good long jump. Now, some people may just have better technique at one or the other, and that is why there's not a perfect correlation between these two variables, but there's a pretty strong one nevertheless. And the line of best fit is calculated by minimizing the x and y deviations from the line. Now this is an example of a negative correlation, and here we see that 100 meter dash time here on the y-axis, and long jump distance on the x-axis. So notice that the further you can long jump, out here, maybe at six meters, your predicted 100 meter dash time is lower than if you were to long jump only four meters. According to the line of best fit. And in this case, there is no correlation. So now we're looking at two completely unrelated variables, grade point average and long jump ability. Now, in this case, there's no correlation because it, we couldn't really plot a line with any kind of slope. The line of best fit would probably be just about horizontal. Now, it's important to realize that Pearson R correlation coefficients test the strength of a linear relationship between two variables. They do not look for curvilinear or any other type of nonlinear relationship between variables. So it may be that there's some sort of a parabolic um, relationship between variable x and variable y, or maybe there's an inverted u type of relationship between variable x and variable y. Well, if you ran a Pearson product moment correlation coefficient, you would not test the strength of those relationships, you would be testing the strength of a linear relationship. So if we check out the graph right here, we see that two theoretical variables have been tested, and in fact it looks like the line of best fit is curvilinear and not linear. But if we plotted a straight line, then these points up here would be above the line and over here would be above the line, so at the two extremes of this x value. And then right at the midpoint of, the, of these x values, we have a lot of points below the line. And so a linear line of best fit is not suited to this data set. And what this shows us is that researchers and as sports scientists and strength coaches, we want to be able to look at this data and visualize it first as a scatter plot in conjunction with running correlations. Because if we run a correlation, you know, we may get that there's a moderate relationship. If we run a correlation between the y and the x values in this case, in this theoretical case, we might see that there's some sort of a moderate linear relationship. But then when we graph them and we see, oh, you know what, that's actually, that looks pretty curvilinear, then we might need to change up our statistical analysis. Now, there are a couple different ways of calculating the correlation coefficient. Remember that the Pearson R represents the relationship between the z-scores of the subjects of two different variables. And so we would use this equation, and it would be the sum of all, that's what this epsilon stands for, the sum of all products of the z-scores from the x and y variables over the population. And we could calculate it this way from two theoretical sets of data from the x and y variables. So these are two theoretical variables. And notice that you can see that there's some sort of association, right? So 2 and 1, 3 and 2, 5 and 3, 5 and 4. So it looks like that as one of them rises as x rises, y rises as well. And so we would compute z-scores over here and then take the product of those z-scores, sum them together, and then divide by the total number of scores. And in this case, if we divide by the total number of scores, 
we would get an R value of 0.945 or rounded up to 0.95. And that's a very, very strong correlation, a very strong positive correlation between these two sets of numbers. Now there's a second formula. That first formula was called the definitional formula. And typically though, what we see, the formula that we see used is called the machine formula. And this is what's coded into most of our stats programs. And it's called the machine formula because we typically don't calculate it by hand. We use a machine to do so. And we can see, although it doesn't use those direct Z values, we can see that within this formula, we have the score minus the mean for X and the score minus the mean for Y. So really baked into this formula are standardized values of both the X and the Y variables. Now we need to remember that variance, which we've discussed before in these videos, is a type of covariance in which we assess how a variable co-varies with itself. And in the case of the Pearson R, we are assessing how one variable, X, co-varies with a different variable, Y. So instead of assessing variance within a variable, we're looking at variance between two variables. How much does the variance in one, in one variable, variable X, also explain the variance in variable Y? So the covariance and the absolute value of R are big when X and Y deviate from their respective means in a consistent manner. So for a positive relationship, we would see a big X and a big Y variance. In a negative relationship, we would see a big X and a small Y or a small X and a big Y. Now, anytime we are computing the correlation coefficient R, we are also interested in whether or not there is a statistically significant outcome. So essentially, are our results sufficiently different from zero so that we can reject the null hypothesis? Now, the statistical significance is entirely sample size dependent. So we could get an erroneously large R value or small R value just because of sampling error. So imagine our vertical jump example. If we somehow randomly pulled a bunch of people who could jump really high but maybe had zero weight training experience, then we would probably get a very low correlation coefficient, so a very small R value, close to zero on either the negative or positive end, who uh, showing that even though they could jump high, it really didn't matter what their power clean level was. And so we would show that there's no relationship. When in reality, if we tested people who could both jump and power clean with proficiency, then we would see a larger R value. So the smaller your sample size, the larger your R value needs to be to be significant. So if you are testing then for an effect that might be very small, maybe there's a very, very small relationship between two variables, but it's a real relationship and it's an important one. You need a large sample size to be able to detect it with sufficient statistical power. Now, in order to evaluate the effect size or the practical significance of a correlation, we want to examine what's called the common variance. Okay, so if we have two variables, variable y and variable x, and if we imagine that within these two circles lie all of the variance in these two variables, the amount of overlap in variance is referred to as shared variance. And that's really what we're testing with an R value. Now, if we take the R value and we square it, that gives us the area of overlap. And there's a bunch of names for this, as I've already mentioned a couple of them, common variance, shared variance, variance accounted for, or explained variance. So if our relationship or R value is X, then our shared variance or common variance is X squared. So for example, an R value of 0.8 would be a shared variance or explained variance of 0.64. And what this means practically is that 64% of variance is shared in common and that 36% is unexplained. So if you have a vertical jump and let's say that it is um, a 0.7 R value as far as the relationship to a power clean, I'm just making that up. So you test a bunch of people on their vertical jump and you test a bunch of people on their power clean and you get an R value of 0.7. If you square that, 0.49, would be the shared variance between those two 
variables. And so what that means practically is that there is about 51% of unexplained variance. So other factors that contribute to either the power clean or to the vertical jump that are not explained by the other variables. Now another value for r squared is called the coefficient of determination. And therefore, the opposite of it, 1 minus r squared, would be called the coefficient of non-determination. So to recap, correlations are used to assess the relationship between two different variables. And we want to assess both the strength and the direction of the resulting r value that we get from calculating this correlation coefficient. Typically, we use a Pearson r correlation coefficient to calculate the the strength of a linear relationship between two variables, and that r value will range between negative 1 all the way up to 1. And values closer to negative 1 or to, or to 1 are stronger, and those closer to 0 are weaker. And we also want to be sure to check the statistical significance, so whether or not our p-value is less than 0.05, in order to determine was this result due to an actual relationship that is different than zero in our sample, or whether there's a good chance that this could be due just to random sampling error. And the larger the sample size, the better power you have of detecting smaller relationships in your data. Now, in the next couple of videos, we will be examining bivariate regression. So we're predicting one variable from another, and this is where correlation starts to become really useful. And we will dive in how to run both correlations and simple regressions in both Excel and SPSS. So click on over to the next video to continue learning, and I'll see you guys in the next video.